Riley's acting so weird. Why is she acting so weird? What do you expect? All the islands are down. Joy would know what to do. That's it. Until she gets back, we just do what Joy would do. Great idea. Anger, fear, disgust. How are we supposed to be happy? Mm -hmm. Hey, Riley, I've got good news. I found a junior hockey league right here in San Francisco. And get this, tryouts are tomorrow after school. What luck, right? Hockey. Uh-oh, what do we do? Guys, uh, th 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 this, uh, here, you you pretend to be Joy. Won't it be great to be back out on the ice? Oh yeah, that sounds fantastic. What was that? That wasn't anything like Joy. Uh, because I'm not Joy? Yeah, no kidding. Did you guys pick up on that? Uh-huh. Mm -hmm. Sure did. Huh? Something's wrong. Should we ask her? Let's probe, but keep it subtle so she doesn't notice. So? How was the first day of school? She's probing us. I'm done. You pretend to be Joy. What? Okay. Um, hmm. It was fine, I guess. I don't know. Oh, very smooth. That was just like Joy. Hello. Hey, Bill. Hi. Hello. Thanks for being here. Thanks for having me. Nice to see you. Uh, I saw a headline this morning when I was uh, researching for things to look up for this interview that you had stalked the directors of uh, this film to try to get a part in it, or they had come to you or something? No, I stalked them. Uh, I went on a tour of Pixar, um, like an 11-year-old, and uh, I went off the tour and kind of just <laughs> went into Pete Doctor's office and said, hire me. No, um... No, we just kind of hung out, and then uh, I was more interested in learning, you know, um, about how they write and how they come up with their stories. They're so, these amazing storytellers, and so I wanted to do that, and they, they were nice enough to let me hang out in the story room run by this great guy, Josh Cooley, um, who's now directing, he's a co-director on um, Toy Story 4, but he, Josh Cooley was the guy that kind of, showed me the story room of there, and we just, I just hung out there for a, a couple weeks, and then... You she, love hanging around with, I mean, you hang out with the South Park guys yeah. who are also so focused on story and yeah. structure, in the same way that I would say that Pixar is. Yeah, yeah, and it's very similar, and I just am, it's just something I'm fascinated by, and it's something I'm not, like, you know, I'm not that great at. <laughs> It doesn't so, come in natural to no, you. No, it comes naturally, yeah. Um, so I want to just learn about it and see how they do it. And so much of it is just trial and error. And uh, You could be like the next Robert McKee or something, the guy oh who can't God, write no. the scripts but yeah. can talk about on story and structure. Of, yeah, yeah, exactly. No one has Robert McKee's book in either of those buildings. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's not true. That's not true. I think they do at Pixar. Um, but, and it's a fine book. Oh, now I'm going to get got sued. It. Um, <laughs> great. Uh, no, but yeah, they, those guys are great. You know, they're just so they're so welcoming. And then after two weeks of it, Jonas, uh, the producer, said, um, "Hey, do you want to play Fear?" <laughs> I said, "Yeah." <laughs> and I went. It worked. Would you have played anything really that they came to you with? Were yeah, you if they huge... said anything, I'd be like, "Yeah, sure, you got it," and I would do it. Are you a huge Pixar fan beforehand oh, huge, going into it? Huge. I saw. I just, from Toy Story on, I've just been a huge fan. I think I saw Up like four times in the theater. I just kept going back and seeing it and going, oh, this is so amazing, you know? And those, the South Park guys are such story nerds that we would take apart, you know, Up or The Incredibles or, you know what I mean? You kind of sit there and go, why does that work? And that works because of this. And, you know, it's a, um, but then you get there and they're not thinking like that. You know, Pete Doctor is never saying, well, the act two reversal has to be, he's just, it's, he's going on feeling and, and mood and, and tone and just telling you the story. And the thing that I learned there that was interesting was Pete would go, okay, let's start by just, let's, let's, you just came out of this movie Inside Out. What's it about? And you would start the meeting that way, you know? Go, okay, it's about this little girl, she's moved and, you know, and you would go and it'd be fine for a while and the minute you go, and then he, um, uh, you know, and Pete would go, that's what we're working on today, that, that scene. That's know? like an old Sidney Lumet thing that he talks yeah. about in his book on making movies, where it's when he was directing an actor or telling the story for a movie that he was pitching, as soon as he felt someone look away or he got hung up, he knew that's where the problem started yeah, right away. Yeah, that's where the problem is, yeah. And I think that's so smart. I mean, it is saying, you know, they would, I mean, Pete was saying, why is it when I walk out of a movie that I haven't directed, you know, I walk out of the theater that I'm 
like I, you know, I feel I'm super smart about what worked and what didn't work in the movie, you know? And so it's always trying to get to that place about our own movie, you know? And saying, okay, we just walked out of that film. What did you like about it? What did you not like about it, you know? Um, I don't know. So it's really cool. It's cool. Now, with, um, with, uh, with a lot of shows now that are animated, they bring the cast together. Like Bob's Burgers is very well known for bringing the cast together and having them there. But a lot of the animated movies, people are sort of doing their voices in, in different places. Did you have Amy there with you? Did you have Mindy no. there with you? <laughs> no. <laughs> I didn't get to meet any. I just met Louis Black. I just, we, really? just, we just met each other. <laughs> I go, hey, you punched me a lot in this movie. And he was like, get away from me. Uh, no. Who are, um, so who are you reading with, and how is that reading with those people who are not necessarily... Well, you, usually when you do these animated movies, you're sitting just in a booth, and there's people on the other side of the booth, and, and uh, they go, okay, so line 203, take one, and you go, hey, guys, and then they all like sit and talk for a while, <laughs> and then come back and go, Bill, that was good, um, and let, let's just try it again. Yeah. <laughs> Take two, yeah, two or three, take two. And you're like, hey guys. And you go. <laughs> um, and it's very laborious. And you so get, you get very self conscious. Um, but the way that Pixar works is you're in a big room, you know, and they have a table in front of them. And it's, you know, the producer and Pete and Josh Cooley, and they're all there with you. And you're doing the scene kind of with Pete. And they just they they just hit record. There's no take this, take that. They'd never they just they figure it out later. Some poor assistant editor has to go through and grab things. And we just, you know, we just start going and riffing. And I think that's why the performance in the performances in this feel so kind of alive and uh nuanced and you know, some of the stuff Polar does in this um dramatically is unreal, you know. And she said so much of that was just Pete being with her and her um, not, you know, having to think about takes or whatever, going, that was good, let's try it again. And, you know, very soft, you know, very, he's very, doesn't say a lot and he's very gentle and very, you know, it's, it's cool. What did you think about the concept for the film when it was pitched to you? When, when I thought of it, it, it was like a, a great pop song that I was like, God, of course, that's a, you have to do that. That's a brilliant idea. And yeah. it's also so perfect and simple. Yeah, the way Pete Doctor pitched it to me was he brought me in uh, to this office and he had a you know PowerPoint thing and he went, so this is my daughter Ellie. Uh, this is her when she was six years old. Look how fun and sweet she is. She's having so much fun. And now here she is at eight. Look how happy she is. He goes, now here she is at 12 and her <laughs> hair is in front of her face and she's like that. And he goes, so how did, it go, how did she go from that to that? I don't, like, I want to know what's going on with her, you know? And it and and so it came from this very uh, real m place for him, you know, uh, and and of him being kind of worried about his kid, you know, and remembering when he went through that, you know, and and then he said, so I did some research and I distilled all these emotions down to f these five emotions, and then I thought, well, what if they were the seven dwarfs, you know, and that's the seven dwarfs in your head and. They represent this thing and, and everything. And then he pitched me the movie, and I cried at his pitch. You cried during the pitch? I cried in front of a grown man, yeah. What was, what was the moment that made you cry? What was the thing? Well, I don't want to ruin the movie. It would ruin the movie. But, um, but yeah, I, I can't say. But it, he, it just the whole, but just I thought it was incredibly sweet, and it was something that I um, related to, you know? That time in your life when, you know, around the age of 13 and 14, you just get, grumpy and so angry. pissed and you're just <laughs> in your room and you're just everybody fuck off and you know and and, and just, I just discovered Nine Inch Nails is broken yeah. and I can't stop. I remember listening to Helmet meantime yeah. <laughs> loud. It's like dun -dun 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 -dun, you know like having to go home because I had a Misfits t-shirt on yeah, they told me to change this this is bullshit <laughs> I had my hair like shaved on this side and long on that side, and I shaved shapes acne. into my head. <laughs> acne, yeah. It was either when I went to high school, either you went the kind of misfits punk look, which is what I had, or you had the Vanilla Ice like lines. 
I Both had, were lame. I just had random <laughs> shapes, I swear to God. And really? everyone was like, yeah, even the people who I thought were cool that I wanted to impress were like, no, you didn't do it. That was like, stupid. Dude, what, are you, what happened to you, man? <laughs> I, had, like, I had a barber do it, not a person that was creative. <laughs> All right, you want to be cool? I'll, give, I'll put shapes in your head. I don't know. That was basically it. I don't know what this kid that wants. That was the barber I was just doing there. Um, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, you know, um, and for someone to sit and make a movie about that time, let alone a, you know, a Pixar Disney film, you know, um, I, just, I just thought, I remember saying to him, I wish this story existed when I was that age because then I would have thought, oh, I, I wasn't alone, you know. You think you're alone. You feel like you're the only person going through this, you know, and and you're not, you know. And and I it's thought crazy because it you're just home. surrounded by so many other people going through it. Yeah, at and the same they seem so well adjusted. All my friends who clearly weren't in retrospect <laughs> were clearly huffing nitrous and stuff. And I was like, God, nitrous Nick is so well adjusted. <laughs> Thanks, man. <laughs> Would you say, uh, when I interviewed you before and we talked about how you sort of got to SNL, and I've heard you say this before, would you say that you sort of fell in to acting, that you were more of like a fan and wanted to be a filmmaker and then just kind of fell backwards into becoming an actor? Kind of, yeah. I mean, I worked at it once I, I, I think, I don't know, a lot of people I feel like, I feel you go through this where, you know, I moved to LA to be a filmmaker and, and I was there for six years doing a wide variety of jobs PA, PA jobs, assistant editing, things like that. And then I decided to, I went, you know, through a bad breakup and decided I have to do something different. And so I went, I started taking improv classes. And um, one of the teachers, I remember this guy, Dave Rizowski, um, said, you're really good at this. And I hadn't had anybody tell me I was good at something in years, <laughs> you know? <laughs> and it really, you know, and I, I Really? And just that alone um, gave me the drive to explore it further, you know, and, um, and work hard at it. You Do know? you think the years you spent toiling on sets as a PA or as an assistant editor or all these different jobs gave you a better perspective when you finally got to something like SNL? Not just yeah. the perspective of that success is this, but just the perspective of like, I know what that guy does and I know exactly, what that guy's yeah. thing is like. And, and these people are working really hard. They're there before you, and they're going to be there after, you know, on the day. So I show up. I can't be grumpy when I show up to work because all these crew guys have been there for an hour and a half before I show up, and they're going to be there an hour and a half after I leave. I can't be a dickhead. And if the Teamsters <laughs> get win, they're going to fuck with you a little bit. <laughs> and they totally deserve it. <laughs> no, and also I had a real romantic version of making films, you know. When you look at film directors, it's always them pointing like a black and white <laughs> shot of someone going like, or talking to someone. And then you get on a set and I'm like, ah, oh, that's bullshit. It's just work, you know what I mean? It's everyone, no one knows what they're doing. <laughs> you know, everyone's trying to, Everyone's trying to, you know, um, you know, uh, someone I can't think of who some director said, you know, directing a film is like trying to build a house of cards on the on a speeding boat. You know, it's just it's just insanity, and um, and so um, it knocked all that kind of romanticism out of out of me. You know, and then going to SNL, I did the same thing with writing and performing where it's a job. You gotta, you know, SNL. I would go in on Tuesday with no ideas, and I'd I'd want to go home. I don't have anything this week. And like tough. You gotta come up. Like you can't it's your job to come up with shit. You know, you it's a grind. It's a grind. And you sit there and John Mulaney and I would just stare at each other going, What are we gonna write? <laughs> you know, or me and Fred Armisen or whoever, and we would just go, I don't what are we gonna do? What would you do to jog something loose if you didn't have any ideas in the moment? How would you We would you guys just start doing bits and me and Fred and John would just start doing bits. John Mulaney's a genius though, and he would come up with something and we would go, Yeah. I remember one thing we did that we tried to write that no one liked was we were just doing this time life voice where I like like about the sixties. <laughs> so it was like Woodstock John Lennon. <laughs> and John Mullaney and, and Fred and I did that for months. We would just walk by each other and go, Monterey Pop Festival. <laughs> the Hell's Angels. And then we go, you want me to take that again? Or I'll take it again. Monterey Pop Festival. 
Mick Jagger, <laughs> the Hell's Angels. And we would just do this, and we were like, how do you work that into a sketch? And then another thing we did was John had this idea of a Canadian uh, talk show, like Canadian news, where everyone's really nice. And, it, and he had this idea that made me laugh, which you know those things where it's like, who wore it better? It was the Canadian version of that, and it was called They Both Look Nice. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Um, and, and yeah, so that came from John going, they both look nice. And we would walk around going like, oh, that's nice. Oh, that's so. And we would always go, well, we don't have any guests today because the, the road's closed. <laughs> and, that, and then Fred would just talk about the roads being closed. And, but that would go on. The, I used to do this character, Herb Welch, who was the old reporter who would hit people with his microphone and stuff. And uh, that came from, thank you, uh, that came from us watching a YouTube clip of these two guys arguing with each other, this old reporter arguing with a guy in the studio. And then that same week, I was doing a sketch with Emma Stone where I was a reporter talking to her. And I kept, during rehearsals, I had to switch between her and Kristen Wiig, and I, during rehearsals, would hit them with the microphones because they're my friends. <laughs> I could just be like... Poof, poof, poof. And just the sound it made was making us laugh. And then John is the guy that goes, oh, we should have that the old reporter guy do that and hit people microphones. And I was like, yeah, that sounds good. Yeah, all right. Did you ever have a day, I mean, early, when you realized that, you know, it was a grind and you had to have ideas, was there ever a time very early on where you showed up and didn't have ideas and someone had to pull you aside or something like, Bill, this is the way it goes here, you gotta... Oh, no, I was too afraid. To, I just would just stay there until something happened. And, I mean, my first couple of seasons, I would try to write stuff by myself and it was just painful. It was just not good. And so I, I really relied on the writers. You know, people like Kristen and Fred and Andy and... They could write things by themselves. They were really good at generating material. I, I needed to get, sit down with a writer and go, I have this voice, something with this guy, you know. Um, but that's, you know, the, the Vinny Vedecci, the talk show host. I had no idea what to do with that. I would just walk into a writer's room and go, hey, Buffalo Gun, what got to be? And I'm like, what, what, someone with that, you know? <laughs> <laughs> and they would go, uh huh, okay, all right. Um, or the writers would give me great, um, I would just be kind of blessed with some great sketch. Um, my last season I had a lot of those. The, um, the sketch that Rob Klein and John Solomon and Michael Bryan wrote, where I was a guy teaching, or I was a guy in a puppet class. I don't know if you saw that one, or I was a guy from Grenada. I was a guy who was in Grenada and I was in a puppet class. <laughs> and I, it was really funny, and you just go, oh, thank you. Thank God they, they wrote that this week because I had nothing, you know. <laughs> but yeah. So you were really good at generating characters, but it was sort of the broad idea or like yeah, being able I had to no pull idea back how to and... form a sketch or any. I still don't really. <laughs> I'm good at editing. I'm kind of good at like those Stefans. We would do that. It would be you know uh, John Mulaney would kind of write it out and we would sit and just talk back and forth. Just it was more just note taking, mm -hmm. you know, just sounds. <laughs> I would just, we would sit across from each other and I would just make a sound and he would go, right. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> yeah, and then he would write it and then I would kind of go in and say, well, what if we put that bit there and that bit over there or whatever? Or just John, one time we were just sitting there trying to write and we were in a restaurant and we were looking over and there was a guy talking to his son very sternly and John went, your mother and I are separating. <laughs> And that became a club, a Stefan club. Your mother and I are separated. Oh, right. That's right. Yeah. How did you uh, develop the voice for fear? Uh, is it mainly it's just, just sort of voice. your voice? I tried all these different voices. I tried doing kind of a Don Knotts thing. I recorded it into my phone, and I sent them to Pete Doctor, and he just kind of said, hey, man, your, your voice is fine, you know? <laughs> I don't know why you're trying to... How did that make you feel? Like, that just relax, man. Don't worry about it, brother. That, like, to Pete, your voice was, like, the perfect representation of this little girl's yeah, idea of fear. you sound like a fear in a little girl's head. Your voice is just... <laughs> it's perfect. <laughs> yeah, I guess. I don't know. I, I had no confidence in it, and he said, don't worry about it. Yeah. 
I mean, it's joy, it's fear, it's anger, sadness, and disgust, right? Yeah. What do you have? You thought at all about what those voices sound like in in your head? Yeah. Um, sometimes. Um, let me look at them. <laughs> well, I guess fear would be my voice. Um, uh, sadness. I always think of the bees, bubble bee. You know that? <laughs> yeah. What is that cartoon that? character? Who is that? Is anyone, it's a uh, sweet. Droopy dog, yeah. Yeah, that's right. Booby boo. Disgust. I mean, Mindy Kaling's a good disgust. She's like, she's just really, went to her character is the joy, I would say, yeah, I would say Amy Poehler. Um. Sadness kind of does sound like the droopy dog, too. Yeah. Who does the voice for Sadness again? Uh, Phyllis Smith. That's she's right, wonderful. from The Office. Yeah, she's, she's so wonderful. good. And Louis Black's pretty good, too. I think the voice is constantly in my head. Uh, we did this the other day, and I said Bruce Willis. For anger? Just in general. <laughs> <laughs> just For when everything. I just have thoughts in my head, it's like, hey, we better get out of here. <laughs> hey, I think, uh, think I uh, want a cheeseburger today. That, like, that, that comes from like this, like... the worst fucking Bruce Willis <laughs> That comes from this sort of mental idea of wanting to see yourself as, like, the coolest guy in the room, I feel No, like. I think it's just weird. It's just... Because <laughs> he's always kind of the coolest guy. Yeah, I guess. He kind of always knows what's going on, except when he's a ghost. <laughs> 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 then he knows... Then he knows nothing. Absolutely And then a little nothing. kid has to tell him, and he's like, oh, I feel like an idiot. A six-year-old <laughs> knew I was a fucking ghost, and I don't know how I'm going to um, so have you watched this movie with an audience yet? Have you experienced the no. flow of tears? No, no. We went to a screening at um, um, Skywalker Ranch and um, with just the main kind of people and the filmmakers, and it was great. We had such a good time, and, uh, and we all cried. And, yeah. Did Louis Black cry? I don't know if he did. Richard Kind was in the movie. He, I think he cried, you know. <laughs> Amy Poehler was next to me like this, and she just in the middle of one. Dude. <laughs> yeah, it was just, oh. That was generally my reaction, too. It was like, you got me, you guys. Son of a, I was like, Pete, what is wrong with you? You made up, you know? And then Ronnie Del Carmen, who's a co-director on this, this wonderful, very shy guy, wonderful guy, super sweet. And he goes, I worked on Up a little bit. I go, oh, what did you do? He goes, I designed the sequence in the movie where the old, it just shows the relationship of the old man and his wife through the age. And I go, oh. <laughs> The thing that... Uh, <laughs> a little bit, just a little just bit. Just the thing that made everybody in the world want to, yeah. Oh, my God. We saw that my wife was pregnant with our first kid, and she left. She was like, I can't, I can't handle this. And I was like, oh, oh, my God. How many, how many kids do you have right now? Three. You have three kids. What's the oldest? Five, two, and six months. Did you think about this your kids at all when you were watching this movie and they're yeah. them growing up and the span yeah. of time yeah it's gonna be rough they're all girls too it's gonna be rough but no but no it's great they're super sweet and everything but i remember myself at that time too i think just going oh yeah it's, it was hard it was a it was very and especially this girl the, i mean the essential plot of this film is a girl moves from minnesota to san francisco you know it's just about a girl who moves to a new town and and her kind of first week at school. That's, that's basically what, the, what happens. Her first day at school is heartbreaking. It's rough. Yeah. Yeah, it's really rough. Yeah. Let's open it up for questions. See who we uh, have up here first. Who's got some questions? Hi, Don. Hey. Um, being that you kind of killed my dreams of wanting to do acting now or voiceovers. Why? <laughs> I don't know. What did why? he do? I always dreamed of him being so much you fun. You still do it. You made him sound redundant. But Oh, no. I'm <laughs> a sad person, though. <laughs> That's right. I I'm answer. just a bummer. <laughs> I'm just a, I'm a genuine bummer. That's why they had me play Fear, you know? They're like, who's a guy that bums us out and is neurotic? I would also say the stories you were telling about hanging out with the, the writers on SNL and coming up with ideas sounded like a lot of fun. It's great. Don't yeah, let it. I, I, don't let me kill your dreams. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so, well, unlike the Canadian version, then, which one do you think was worse? Was it, you know, doing the voiceovers or when you're actually doing acting or improv? They're both fun and they're both hard. I mean, the, the, the doing voiceovers is incredibly hard. I mean, you're acting 100%. You're using your body, I mean, everything, 
um, but you're trying to channel it into your voice, where when you do a film, you know, you'll do something and then it's, you have five, 10 minutes before the next take, you know? But in this, you do, to just keep going, you know? And you're screaming at the top of your lungs. I mean, basically every line I have in this movie, I'm screaming, <laughs> you know? And so you scream and then they say, you know, we gotta get out of here, whatever. It was great, just do a series is what they call it. So you, I gotta get out of here, I gotta get out of here. I gotta get out of here, you know, and you do it, through, and then the you just your brain doesn't know what the words mean anymore. Um, but the joy of it is going to see that first screening to see the world that these guys came up with, and you just go, I can't believe I'm in this thing. You know, this is what, all these animators and these amazing artists. What the these guys? This is phenomenal, you know. Um, and then you know, acting, uh, doing improv or acting in film is is. Uh, is a blast, is an absolute, I love it, you know. The actual work is so much fun, especially when you're working with great people, and I've been unbelievably lucky to work with some amazing actors that you learn a lot from. And I learned the really good ones are really laid back and cool, and I just got to work with Julianne Moore, who's like, you know, one of my heroes, and so chill, and you know, it was awesome. Hi, Bill. Hi. Um, Stefan has brought me to tears multiple times, and I personally, like he went to your house, and <laughs> <laughs> that would be scary. He's um, not leaving. <laughs> <laughs> and I love watching you crack up playing mm -hmm. Stefan. So, which was the funniest Stefan bit that you did? Oh well, John Mulaney, you know, I think it's well that he changed things in the cue cards to make me laugh <laughs> constantly. And so, and he always knew to do it when the cue card would, so it was the top of the next card, so I couldn't see it coming, and then he would turn. Um, but one thing he said that really broke me up hard was um, we had, there's a couple, but the first one that comes to mind was we had a, a character that we had come up with called uh, Drewly Lips Jackson. He's a two-year-old ultimate fighter. Drew Lips Jackson, he has face like empanadas and he's addicted to ecstasy. That was the line. And so we had that. And then John changed it to two year old ultimate fighter, Drew Lips Jackson. Um, he's got uh, fists like empanadas and then the card turns over and goes, and he's my best friend. <laughs> that was. I just was, and, and also what you can't see is the cue card guy is laughing and then beyond the cue card guy is Mulaney kind of smugly sitting there watching me, <laughs> like kind of, you know, watching me suffer. <laughs> right here? Uh, yeah, so I've got two questions, so don't shoot me. Um, the first for, yeah. No, I'm <laughs> The first four picks are, did you do like any sort of scientific research and like go actually into what the fear emotion does to people? And secondly, you said that you started out in improv. Do you rather improv over sketch or sketch over improv? Um, to answer your first question, um, no, I, I, I really didn't. I mean, but Pete and Jonas and the writers did a ton of research and met with these amazing, you know, professors. I don't know anything about anything, so I'm not going to pretend that I'm like pr professor genius from awesome institute. I don't know, <laughs> but um, but they met with all these these guys, and they they really did dis they distilled it down to these five emotions, um, and you know, fear for me. They said, you know, what Pete was cool, he goes, what do you think would be the embodiment of fear? Because I mean, he, he was really smart in saying, I want to find an archetype of a person that embodies that emotion. You know, disgust is kind of like a bratty, you know, like 14-year-old girl or whatever. And, um, and, and I said, well, what about, like, you know, like a middle management type guy, you know? Like a guy that works middle management at Staples or something, you know, or, you know, and he, he went, great. And I remember as we, he said that he drew a bow tie, uh, the bow tie on him and went, oh, so he would have a bow tie and a sweater and just how you see him right now, I got to watch that happen live in front of him. I was like, whoa, you're Pete Doctor, whoa, sweet, you know. <laughs> I'm so unimpressive in the room. Um, but, uh, and then next, your other question of improv or, or um, sketch, I, I, personally enjoyed sketch 
because I liked writing and thinking out the idea and then getting out there and, and, and adding to it. I loved creating something and then you keep adding to it and that, and, and even in the performance, at SNL, I would get incredibly nervous before shows, and I would, the way I would get out of that was, um, I, oh, I'm nervous about messing up. So I would purposely, in my mind, mess up. So if I, I played a ton of game show hosts, and so if I came as a game show host and said, you know, the line was, hello, ladies and gentlemen, or whatever, I would say, hello, hello, ladies and gentlemen. And in my mind, I went, oh, I said a second hello. I messed up. Oh, I'm still alive. Okay, we're fine, you know? <laughs> and... But within that, you start, then I relaxed, and you could start messing around, you know? I would do super weird, when I would play James Carville, I would do all these weird things, like, like with my hands and head, like, like, it made no sense. But that was just feeling relaxed and wanting to add to it, and you just have all this energy, and you just bring it out, and you want to try things. Um, it was fun. It kind of goes back to the old improv thing, though, that, like, it doesn't all have to be funny. You just have no. to be willing to keep trying and keep trying. Yeah, but I, I would not have, so by I say, I would not have the, the um, confidence to do that if I hadn't gone through improv training and failed a bunch, you know, and just fall on your face over and over and over again and just go, well, that, that sucked, you know, and well, what, how'd that go wrong? Oh, I shouldn't do that, you know. And you learn, you learn through that. What triggers your, your fear, Guy? In your head, <laughs> oh, that I'm just gonna um, so many things, but yeah, but SNL, it was just I would always, you know, I'd have a heavy show or whatever it was, and and uh, just can I get everything? And and I really wanted my, you know, the impressions to sound right, and I wanted the jokes to land right, and I just really worked hard, kind of obsessively, to get things working, and I was very tight, you know. And I remember after my fourth season, Laura Michaels said you know, you've got the job, relax, <laughs> you know, just relax. And I thought, I think after that, I, I calmed down a little bit. I saw a quote from Louis C.K. recently, and I think The Hollywood Reporter, and he had said, we're all just two bad decisions away from sleeping on the street. Mm -hmm. And it's like Louis C.K. saying that, and I saw that, and I was like, I am going to be thinking about this every decision for like the next three weeks. <laughs> I've never thought about that. <laughs> it's like terrified. Oh, thank you. <laughs> had to pass it on Great. to someone. It's like that horror movie thing. I have to pass it on, so now you have to pass it There's on. There's a horror else. movie where they... Oh, no, great. Like uh, next question. Do we have any more questions? <laughs> yeah, right here. Hi, Bill. Uh, Hi. I wanted to know, have your kids seen the film, and if so, do they recognize your voice? Uh, they have not seen the film. Um, I think we're going to take them to, after the film comes out, take them to you know, a matinee or something. Um, they, they, yeah, it's been on Disney Channel, you know, like little things for it on the Disney Channel. And um, and they play with the toys, and they call you know disgust, anger, you know, like disgust, sadness, anger, joy, and daddy. <laughs> 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 yeah, that's very sweet. Is it easier for you to watch yourself in an animated film rather than no. another film? No, I never watch. I don't. I watch everything once usually, and then that's good. Yeah. It would I, feel weird, right? I just don't like it. Yeah, I I. I did this film, The Skeleton Twins, and I saw that, and then the filmmaker just said, will you please sit in the, in the premiere? It would really mean the world if you and Kristen sat next to me in the premiere, and I was like, okay. And I just had a complete and total panic attack while I was watching the movie, and he went, he went um, forget it. Like, you can go. Like, this sucks. <laughs> how, <laughs> <out of> <laughs> like, how far did you get into oh, it? I watched the whole movie. Oh, okay. I, I watched the whole movie, but he was just, oh. I, I think I broke my wife's hand. I was just sitting there like, this is so awful. Um, and then, uh, so, yeah, that's, uh, that's a thing. Yeah, I usually just watch things once. But I, I think it's because I have a, uh, um, an idea of what I'm doing, and the actual work, the actual playing the part is what's so fun, you know, and doing your own research and, and working with the other actors. Like I said, I've been so lucky to work with such great actors that I feel, like, you know, as once that's done, then my job's done, and I go, oh, cool, you know? And then when they make me watch myself, <laughs> it's never a, I just go, ah, oh, God, well, I don't, 
I, you know, my head, it's this, but instead I sound this way and I got weird posture and my face and, you know, it's just you're self-conscious watching yourself. And no one and so wants I don't to, want to have that in my head while I'm working, you know. No one wants to put themselves on screen and then be sit, sort of caught sitting around watching themselves on screen <laughs> over and yeah, over again. I, 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 yeah, I'm not, I'm not that person. Yeah, I don't know what's going on any on anything <laughs> on the internet for that fear of just going like, oh, cool, ah, <laughs> you know. <laughs> Yeah. I think we have time for one more question. Um, just a brief question um, regarding the fact that you went from SNL, which I loved you on, Stefan, the Californian, Californians, I can't even speak it, but um, just going from a whole improv role where initially, yeah, you had the week to prepare for SNL and you only had one really take to do it. It's live, switching it to an actual where you can do multiple recordings and it's multiple takes. Would you consider it more tiring and more rewarding for it, or do you kind of miss that field in which you have to be always on point every single time? Uh, that's a good question. No, I, 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 you're totally right. That is the whole thing with SNL is this, this thing of we have one chance to land this, you know, and so it's all this anxiety and stuff of going, we got, just have to land it, you know, let's try to land this. I remember I went back to host. And Lauren Michaels knows how nervous I get. And he came in before air and was, he was trying to make me feel relaxed, you know. So he was just pitching me stuff for the SNL 40th. <laughs> he was like, maybe Jimmy and Justin doing a rap at the beginning. <laughs> I'm like, I can't handle this right now. Um, Danny does Bassomatic. Yeah, that'd be great. Yeah, Dan Danny Aykroyd doing Bassomatic would be awesome. You know, but I would just be so nervous because you just want to land it, you know. Um, whereas on a film, you can get really lost, you know. You can get into a moment or vibe, you know, with somebody. Um, and there's no camera, there's no anybody. You know, there's a, a couple of times that on Skeleton Twins. I just did this movie, Amy Schumer, Trainwreck, and it's the same thing. You know, we would have these pretty serious scenes. She's wonderful in that movie, by the way. And, and you just, you get, you know... We're in an argument, and it's like, we're in a real argument. There aren't cameras around, and if you mess up, who cares? Just keep moving, and, and that, that what you perceive as a screw-up actually looks great, you know? But on SNL, it was a tightrope, man. It was, you, this line triggers the camera to cut to that, you know? So if I trip up on my line, they don't know where to cut, and now everything's screwed up, you know? You, you're thinking about that. You don't want to be thinking about that. That's why I felt like I was always, I love doing update because it was just right out to camera, and you could, you could be subtle, you know? And I, I learned that watching Kristen Wiig do Update. She could be subtle, and I go, oh, wow, she's doing really, you know, really nuanced stuff up there. I need to get to that place, you know? And, and so I try that with Stefan or doing James Carville or whatever, make it feel more interior, you know, or whatever you want to call it. Um, so I don't know if that answers your question, but that's a good question. I think about that actually a lot. What did you think of the SNL 40th? Were you there? I don't remember. Yeah, yeah, I was me. there. I was in the show. Thanks. Um, no, I'm joking. I knew it. I knew it. I watched the <laughs> 40th. Like, that's like, my time. No. Uh, no, I, I was on there for five seconds. No, don't worry about it. Um, I'm sorry. We did a Californians. That's right. And uh, I, was, I did stuff on. But it's, it's fine. Um, <laughs> oh, boy. This is going to get awkward. Cut it. <laughs> no, 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 no. Uh, I'm totally joking, by the way. Um, uh, it no, was I awesome. I thought you were wonderful. <laughs> don't, don't, don't do that. Um, <laughs> no, no, it, it was great. It was so awesome. And it was uh, just overwhelming. Just sitting there and there's, there's there, there, everyone is, you know, and, and it was amazing. It was just a, a phenomenal night, you know. I'm getting to hang with everybody and, and, um, see every, all those different eras, everyone. It was so funny, all the different eras, we mingled, but they kind of, everyone would go to, you know, who you worked with for eight years, you know? But the coolest part of that night for me was we did the good nights after the show, and then the audience left, and the only people left at home base were, were the cast the all, of all eras, and that was unreal, and writers, and that was so cool. You know, I was in a circle, it was me, you know, Bill Murray, Eddie Murphy, Will Ferrell, you know, John Lovitz, you know, everyone, 
they they're talking, and then you see these this you know from you know it was. It are was you unreal. able to are you able to keep it cool and stuff like that, or do you go sort of like Wayne's no. World? I'm not worthy. No, I'm just quiet. I get real <laughs> shy. I'm like, oh yeah, <laughs> that's cool. <laughs> All right. No, I no, I'm no, I no. You just sit and hang out and talk. There, everyone's so nice. I remember Gilbert Gottfried said it. Well, he walked up to because I had never met him and we saw each other and we just started laughing and he and he said, "I feel like we all have the same disease." <laughs> I, uh, I think we're done. I think that's all we have time for. Oh wow! For. All right. <laughs> I was wondering if we should. Oh, that's end a good, it nice, at that nice moment. way to uh, end a thing. It's called Inside Out. It's a children's movie. <laughs> <laughs>